Welcome back to Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald. Tonight, you should be excited because we have Mark Mayfrey. Mark is actually the CTO of Beyond Trust, but more importantly, Mark is also a famous or even infamous hacker who used to go by the name of Sniper and Rhino9. We're going to get started with Mark right now. Thank you so much for coming in and talking to me, Absolutely, man. Happy to be here. i got to tell you, as a friend, I've wanted you to come on this show for years, and I really appreciate you finally agreeing to no, come absolutely. on the program. Happy to be here. Um, we know that today the world of cybercrime is a huge deal, and I know that you're honestly quite a player in that market. So can you give me a little bit of background? You started this at 17 years old. How did that go? How do you go from the wrong side of the line to the right side of the line? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what's most you know important to understand was that you know hacking back in the the kind of late '90s um, was much more exploratory and kind of seeing how things work. And, you know, is uh, about getting out there and breaking into things like universities, governments, whatever had interesting computer systems. And so for me, it was also on a personal note, kind of an escape from uh, let's just say a very crazy upbringing and uh, and home life. So um, got into hacking when I was about uh, about 15 years old or so. Um, and everything escalated quickly into breaking into government systems and other types of, uh, let's say, more sensitive systems. And when I was about uh, about 16 years old, I ran away from home for about a year um, and hacking the entire time and um, was actually staying with some hacker friends in a, in a very famous hacker group called uh, Rhino9, as you mentioned. Yeah. And um, after about a year of that, I actually uh, came back home. And, uh, you know, my mom was relatively cool about it in the sense that she said, you know, hey, if you can get a job and start supporting yourself, don't need to finish school. Uh, if you can't in three months, then you should get probably go, you know, get back to school and, yep, and, and yep. get it going. And, uh, you know, I was lucky lucky enough, I guess you could say, but uh, about uh, two months after getting back uh, from having kind of run away and was hacking, um, I was actually raided by the FBI. Okay, wait, he just said lucky. <laughs> I'm lucky to be raided that's by the good, FBI. Right that's now. good, man. That's good. It's credentials. These that's days, right. right. That's true. <laughs> So uh, you know the the FBI raid was uh, was a good wake up call uh, in a sense of a, in a literal wake up call of how did that wake, go down, up. Mark? I mean, I mean it, it's uh, it's funny because it's a lot like things that you would see in a movie. Um, you know, even though I was a computer hacker and pretty pretty harmless guy from a, a physical sense, um, when they raid you, they, you never know: are you a kid with a gun or have a crazy dad or whatever the situation might be? Mm -hmm. And um, so, what f my first person experience was uh, essentially being uh, asleep. Uh, waking up feeling something by my head, going to brush it, realizing it was somebody with a gun, wow. an FBI agent with a gun, uh, telling me to, uh, you know, kind of stay still while they essentially uh, made sure I didn't have any sort of weapons, anything else. As I'm kind of realizing this is going on, there was a, another uh, FBI agent uh, going past the uh, bedroom window, uh, and neighbors later told us that, you know, they came over the fence, came through the front door, a variety of different things. Quite surreal. Uh, pretty surreal, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's just standard how they how they do it for anything, really. Um, you know, I was lucky enough in the, the kind of incident that they, that they raided me for. You know, I was never charged, don't have a, a record, any of that sort of stuff. But uh, it was ob obviously scary enough. And with being, at that point, about 17 and a half, almost 18, uh, there was already plenty, plenty of uh, precedence to, um, you know, take a take Well, a that's court quite, actually, you adult. really <laughs> are lucky then, because honestly, um, knowing what I know, and this is important for those that are watching, you make a mistake early in life, and some of the biggest opportunities are in computers and effectively yep. computer security. And if you have a criminal background record of any kind, forget it. You're, you're not getting in. Yep. So you got lucky enough to get that experience, be woken up without yep. having to give up your future opportunities. So let's go from there. You They they, they kick in the door. It sounds like a no-knock warrant, clearly. Uh, pretty much. Uh, so. <laughs> right? Roll into your home, and they, and they roll you out. You go through this experience with them. What's next? Um, so pretty much at that point, you know, for... Good, good few weeks was just trying to figure out was I, were they going to come back and arrest me at some point, you know, as they were kind of going through evidence. And my case was a little interesting because um, uh, jointly with the FBI, there was also people from the uh, DOD since all the military systems I was breaking oh, yeah. into. And, um, you know, I never really got closure right away. And so I actually, um, uh, a company where I had been working, uh, doing some kind of IT security work, uh, it was my you know, very first job as a, as a teenager, you know, I started talking to the uh, CEO at the time of, you know, hey, I want to build software uh, that will essentially analyze a company's network and let them see what their network would look like through the eyes of a hacker. Right? No, was What's that Retina? All the, exactly, Retina. Okay. So it's, it's one of the very first uh, what we call vulnerability assessment software. We've actually used this great stuff. And so, you know, being able to give people that perspective of here's the ways to break in, more importantly, here's how to fix it, mm -hmm. uh, was something I was passionate about. There was also nothing like that really happening at the time. 
Uh, and so I started down that uh, path with a friend of mine. This is and, when you were 17. Uh, I was only 17, yeah. So I was learning business quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, amazingly enough, it was within uh, a couple of years, the company was already humming and uh, already had a lot of customers. Um, about two and a half, three years into the company, we actually, um, uh, crazily enough, had won the uh, worldwide contract for the entire Department of Defense. So wow. uh, we had that contract for about 11, 10, let's say over 10 years. Uh, that every military base uh, in the world, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, Marines, Coast Guard, uh, were mandated to use. And it was a, that, that whole thing was a crazy experience. I remember we were in um, uh, San Antonio at one of the bases where they were doing the testing against us and our competitors. And uh, there was a higher up from the uh, military that came in and said, you know, where's this chameleon guy, which was mm -hmm. my old, one of my old hacker nicknames. And I instantly in that moment was like, wow, we're, we're done. <laughs> you know, the guy's going to yeah. remember. No matter, and, uh, by the way, Mark had yeah. colored hair at this time. It was like yeah. blue, right? Blue or, or green, like depending on yeah, the week, okay. yeah. And, um, and you know, sure enough, the guy, guy came in. He ended up being totally cool and was more just, like, impressed that I had turned my life around and was doing something. And yeah. so it went from something that was about to feel like a well, negative to a very thing. positive and I wanna, thing. Well, that's a pretty amazing thing. Let me take that for just a second if yeah. I can because there's a lot of kids that are still exploring. And honestly, I have issues with it because of the, yeah. the, the damage nature. But on the other hand, um, how do you – get them to understand that there is a good side and you can still do the research and enjoy the challenge um, without having to break the law. Yeah, I, th I think what's amazing uh, today, both with how security has changed, where there is entire professions, there's a massive industry, there's so many ways to go. Done well for me. You know, yeah, and you, yeah. Can, you can make money doing this. Um, you know, the, the, the legal form of, of hacking these days is penetration testing, where yep. you're legally hired to break into companies and it's a just as thrilling and, and more challenging, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, and I think also what's different today is that just techno technology itself has grown. You know, you have virtualization technology where you can create your own lab yeah. uh, in your own house. You know, um, again, it's very different in the uh, uh, that kind of late 90s time frame where if you want to go learn about some, you know, interesting version of a Linux or Unix operating system, you know, you, you wouldn't have that uh, in a lab in your house. Right on your computer, you would go find a, a university or a government uh, system that had it. So I, I think beyond that, the big change, though, is that, you know, just as you know, is that cybercrime has come in in such a big way, uh, per particularly in the last five, ten years, where, yeah. you know, I, w I was kind of more exploring and seeing what I could do, but I also didn't have the allure that a lot of kids these days have, where if you have that skills, more than just exploring systems, you can use that to go make money and do real uh, and get too. and get involved in yeah a lot of things that that definitely will be held against you in yeah. some way you yeah, know for sure many so, many many years in prison for, for uh, very scary yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, from that perspective I mean you went from being the person entering the networks to the person on the other side of, in the defense and it's kind of interesting because. When you're a hacker, you only have to get it right once. When you're a right. defender, you always have to get it right. So, what's that like in your life, being, you know, responsible for defending from the from the highest end of the enterprise? I mean, I, I think it, it, defending is is much harder. Just as you said, you have to you have to get everything. <laughs> you know, it's not just that one way. Um, and, and that's what I think is kind of cool. I mean, what drove me to get into hacking is just the curiosity, right? Being the kid taking apart the radio just to see how yep. it worked. Uh, and trying to make things work in a way maybe that they were unintended. That, that curiosity and that thought process is really at the root of most every hacker you meet. And I think what's so cool about trying to create defensive technologies, trying to solve these problems is just intellectually it's much more difficult. Um, it's, yep. it's not always the more glamorous and sexy part in the sense that most of the offensive stuff is, is what kind of runs yeah. the headlines, if you yeah. will, of, of the so world. It gets you the cultural notoriety. Right, right. right. But, uh, but, I, but I would say um, from a pure satisfaction, trying to figure out these complex systems, how do you defend against a whole variety of attacks, a whole variety of attackers, where now it's crossed over where it's not teenagers. Uh, there's the evolution of espionage now, where cyber attacks coming from you foreign bet. countries is just a part of anything. Organized crime is involved. Um, it's, it's cool, in a sense, to be working in a field that, unlike a lot of areas of business, you're not just worried about your kind of company and your product and what you're doing, but how does that have the larger impact? In the and there are lives crime? involved, yeah. So yeah. I, I wrote an article a few years ago called Digital D-Day that was yep. that got some little bit of attention. And I, I think we really have crossed over the chasm into a time when our infrastructure and our security and our military are all at extreme risk. Absolutely. Um, and as the more the more the 
these small actors realize they may not be able to beat us head to head militarily, but they can certainly play in an equal field with us on technology and fight that fight. So That's what absolutely. a great place to be from your perspective. So tell me a little bit about Beyond Trust. What are, there, what, what are you doing so there? So Beyond Trust, I think we do something pretty interesting where um, we still have Beyond Trust acquired uh, my original company, EI Digital Security. Um, and so we have uh, both a combination of the vulnerability assessment, how do hackers break into systems, mm -hmm. uh, and privilege management, which is what are users and what are people who have access to your environment, which could be employees mm -hmm. doing something malicious um, or could be somebody that's stolen access into your right. environment, like a hacker. Um, and we try to bring those two things together where we can tell you not only how people could potentially break in, but a lot of times once a company, you know, you, you take any of the headlines, that, you know, the, the Sony's and everything else going on, by the time servers are actually having stolen uh, data stolen from them, there's usually not so much hacking involved. The hacking's more upfront to steal a level of access that allows you to move throughout the company, yeah. just like any IT person. Yeah, that, would, cascade, really. that cascading access it's, or it's exactly. Access, yeah. So we're trying to bridge those two kind of worlds of the kind of IT security and, and IT operations. So from the perspective of your history, I mean, you discovered the code red worm. You've been testifying before Congress multiple times. So you, you're clearly a cultural icon. What's next for Mark? I mean, what, what's your, you know, what's your, what's your pinnacle for the next five years? What would you like to be doing? Uh, that's a, that's always a hard, that's always a hard question. Um, I mean, I, I, I think these days I, th I think more about the fact of how much has security really kind of evolved and grown, you know, in the last mm -hmm. 10, 15 years. Uh, and, and the reality is a lot of things have actually gotten better. There's a lot of technologies that are better. There's a lot more noise out there because there's, there's that many more people that are trying to yeah. profit off you know, these sort of crimes. A lot of, a lot of false so, claims, too. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the things I think about a lot is that um, a lot of times when security is talked about, it's the more high-profile, large enterprises, governments, virus, spy, all this sort of stuff. And what we've seen is that a lot of cyber attacks, they're affecting just your everyday business where uh, a small business, small medium business is broken into and their bank account you know, has $100,000 drained out of it. Yeah. And those companies are at a, a complete disadvantage right now, and I think it's an area and that individuals people have too, really because focused. it's so sophisticated. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Individuals a whole other challenge, yeah. Yeah. So as we, you know, kind of go forward, I, I think there's two sides to the market. There's that that, and and let me start real quickly. I, I think there's a, our primary issue as a nation, is that other nations' kids seem to want to join the fight against America, right? Right. And it seems that some of our kids are joining the fight against America, too. And I'd really like, if nothing else in my life, to help turn the minds of those kids into defensive fighters for our war against the world, meaning our defense of the nation. Right. How do you convince kids that think it's exciting to go after their own government that maybe it might be better if they got involved in some of the positive things? I mean, I, I think one of the, the first things is kind of like I talked about with the, uh, the allure of, of getting into cybercrime or getting into, you know, just offensive stuff against your own country yeah. is, you know, one of the challenges you have even right now happening, um, you know, with new legislation that's trying to be put through um, that really takes the criminalization of very, very, very small time hacking to, to, the, very to crazy degrees, things. right? right. And, yep. and a lot of it is it's, it's um, kind of double-edged sword that it can be used against just everyday researchers um, and it's not really going to help prevent the next North Korea, China, China et cetera. I so, that, yeah. I mean, I, th I think one of the biggest things is is figuring out how do you embrace more of the hacker culture. And that doesn't mean how do you embrace people committing crimes. Well, that was people, my point, was how more do we the, get them, how do we pull them over exactly. to our side and get them to play with us instead of playing with the, yeah. the enemy, right? I mean, I, I, think it, I think it's like anything of, of uh, you have to give more opportunity, right? So there's, yeah. you know, so many schools these days, and I think a lot of it needs to start a lot younger than it does, but... Yeah. You know, there's a lot of schools that, uh, you know, they might still have wood shop or something, but they don't have, like, Arduino shop or teaching you how to do hardware. Yeah, a lot of truth. Uh, there's, there's just not a lot of good outlets. And so if you don't provide some sort of extracurricular, et cetera, outlet for this sort of skill and talent, mm -hmm. it's going to find some way. And particularly when you're young, you're just more anti-everything. And it's about adrenaline <laughs> right? and it's, so, yeah, notoriety yeah. and all that. That's so why it, I so understand it. I just, yeah. I really would like to find a way to find Yeah, to it's, a, it's so, a hard hard problem. So listen, I'd love to um, get a commitment from you that you'll come back again Absolutely, in the future. Absolutely, man. Is that something you're down for? Absolutely. Mark, as always, man, Thanks thank so you much. so much for coming in and I really appreciate it. I mean, we've got, you know, anonymous fight and ISIS now, so maybe <laughs> right. we can convince those kids to help us do some other positive things. I'm Kevin McDonald. You've been watching Facets Television, and with me tonight has been Mark Mayfrey with Beyond Trust, and I hope you'll come back next time.
Hi, this is Mark Mayfair with Beyond Trust, and you're watching Facets Television. Get in touch with me at www.beyondtrust.com. Hi, I'm Steve Van Warmer from Ion Productions. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Facets Television, and I'm Kevin McDonald, and today with me I have Kobe Travis and the real star of the show, Ruby, right here. And what we're going to talk about today is a product called Findem Scent Safe. And it really is what it is. It's effectively a scent safe. Take a fresh scent from your child or loved one and you put it in the freezer. And if you ever need to find them, these folks help you. So thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank and, you. Uh, so why don't you tell me a little bit about how this started and how it works, if you would. Um, sure. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Worked uh, bloodhounds, missing cases, missing persons, and Alzheimer's and such, and came up with the idea of having families be prepared just in case mm -hmm. if somebody goes missing because it helps the bloodhound have a scent item that's not contaminated. Mm -hmm. um, I have children. I kiss them goodnight. I lean over their pillows to do that. I do the laundry. So my scent is on everything. Okay. And we wanted something where when the dogs aren't finding people, why are they not finding them? And that's where it came up with not having a good scent on them because uh, to find that one person, which is what the dogs do, they scent discriminate and they track that one, mm -hmm. we need to put everything in the dog's favor to find people faster. And then Travis is the one that made the product. Oh, really? Right on. Okay, so how, what, what, what was your inspiration for that? Uh, my partner, actually, um, having the, uh, the overall knowledge and experience and working these um, manhunts and these uh, suspect chases and looking for missing children in law enforcement and then finding that there's a tool that we could possibly be on the, on the, uh, the edge of creating to help locate those people faster with more reliability. Mm -hmm. As Kobe had spoken uh, on, uh, the contamination is a huge factor in our success um, in using these dogs. And they need clarity in what they're looking for, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Scent is like a fingerprint. They're not two alike, um, even with identical twins. So that if we can eliminate the contamination factor and we can apply that in a proactive tool, mm -hmm. such as the Find Em Scent Kit, to give this dog when that unforeseen event takes place, mm -hmm. it could be an amazing location, you know, locate and help bring some closure and a child or, a, or an adult home before it's too late. So how do the folks, how do they get in touch with this product? I mean, how does it work? Is it, are they, uh, are you part of a foundation or are you selling them retail? How does that work? So yes, we, um, we're, we're doing both. We uh, sell it online at www.findemsentkit.com. And we've, uh, Kobe and I have also started a nonprofit uh, organization called the Find Me Foundation. Okay. And that's our gateway of helping uh, families and organizations in need help get those kits for free. Well, that's terrific. And I understand it's endorsed by some really top-notch groups, the International Bloodhound Training Institute, the National Police Bloodhound Association, the Joyful Child Foundation, which is actually in memory of Samantha Runyon. Um, that would be Aaron Runyon's daughter. And I understand, actually, there's some genetics in this dog and the one that looked for uh, poor Samantha when she was missing. Is that true? That is. This is uh, Ruby is related to Maggie, who worked the case with me. Wow, my dog's name is Maggie. That's really cool. Uh, Aaron has been on our program here before, and unfortunately, Aaron lost her daughter to um, a crazy, murderous person. But Aaron is, if she's supporting these folks, she's very careful about what she says and who she supports. She must be, uh, one, grateful, and two, I think, supportive of this product. Um, what kind of luck are you having in getting the community to, to reach out for these? That's our biggest thing is we're trying to educate the community because um, there are fingerprint kits out there, mm -hmm. DNA kits. I that used we, to give them out all the time. Yeah. We absolutely still say use those. Mm -hmm. But one more thing is um, the Find Them Scent Kit because the Find Them Scent Kit helps us locate. We don't want to identify. Right. We want to locate, right. and that's our, our goal. And so if families could help with that tool also, you keep this in your freezer at your home, and heaven forbid anything happen, you hand it to your law enforcement or your search and rescue team, and a dog can be deployed. The thing about it, too, is that when a child goes missing, and this is something that many of you know, I've been involved in the missing children's issue for a long time. If we don't find them quickly, we generally don't find them in a condition that we want, and we want to bring them back safe. And the faster we can do that, the better. And it looks to me like this is a really great way to do that. How can folks get in touch with you again? Can you remind me? 
Yes, it's um, you can buy us online at uh, www.findemsentkit.com, um, and uh, we're available for any contact. Um, you can also reach out to us on the contact button uh, on the website as well. Now, are you guys looking for support partnerships, agency groups, things like that? Are you looking to be working with other nonprofits? Have you reached out? Absolutely. More that we can help others and, and vice versa. I, as long as it's helping the community, mm -hmm. that's our goal and saving lives. That's our goal and we're more than willing to work with anybody because more we work together as a community, um, the more we can help other families. The more lives they get saved. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I got to tell you, I think it's, it's awesome and thank you so much for coming in. I very much appreciate it. And you don't need to change hands. Oh, now, I will. You're very good at it. Thank you. <laughs> one, one thing, too, to mention, if uh, John Walsh ever got wind of what we had, I think he would uh, be a great proponent and uh, a great uh, assistance in us getting it up to the right people as well. Well, we'll have to see about what we can do. I, I've actually uh, met John a couple of different times and, and uh, we'll see what we can do about that. So Thank you for having uh, us. Thank you very much. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with us today are the folks from Find Em Scent Safe. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Brandon McNeil for Ion Productions, and make sure and keep an eye out for the Ask Dino show, the innovation segment, and the new Cutting Edge Facets TV. Hi, I'm Cecily Callen, and I'm part of the crew here at Ion Productions. Thanks for watching our shows. My favorite is innovation segment. What's yours? <laughs>
And we see at that time a cap table that seems reasonable and there is no renegotiation necessary. It's a much, much wiser way to start an early stage business and to reward those who gave you the money at the most risk at the earliest time. The last thing I want to talk about today in this short episode is the every three million dollar crisis. The every three million dollar crisis. There are three predictable crises in early stage businesses. And you may have experienced some already, but let's just talk about them quickly. First of all, assume you have enough money to start. That's not a crisis. You wouldn't have begun business in the first place. But you get to about $3 million of gross revenue, or you get to about 20 employees. And the first crisis is you as an entrepreneur rarely have a span of control wide enough to be able to manage those employees. And you need, for the first time perhaps, somebody in a layer below you to do that management job. The problem is very few entrepreneurs know how to delegate and to give up all of that responsibility. And it is a risk to the company because some entrepreneurs don't survive that particular problem. And it is the first of the problems and we'll call it organizational as the first crisis. The second crisis happens about double that volume. Maybe it's 40 employees, maybe it's $6 million in revenue, but typically it happens when you find that you have shipped so much in the way of services or products into the marketplace the quality is no longer the quality that you thought you had to have when you first began in the business. And that quality suffers a bit. And the first people that notice that are the salespeople for your competitors. You know, it takes a long time to recover from one of those quality problems. And it's one of those things you just need to know in advance. It is a crisis you will have. The third and final one, after you've gone through the crisis of organization and the crisis of quality, is the crisis that is financial. It's not the one that I need to raise cash in order to grow. I need to raise cash in order to stay in business. That may sound a little bit strange, but what happens if you have a receivable that is one or two months old, but you pay your rent and your payroll in advance of that? You have to pay money out before you receive money in at ever higher steps when those businesses are increasing in size. And so you can do a calculation if you're doing let's say uh, $100,000 a month worth of business and you have $100,000 of receivables but you've prepaid the rent and you've paid your payroll on the way up, you may need $100,000 worth of extra working capital in order to continue in business, let alone to grow. So think about those three crises. They happen in order. You have the ability to solve the problems before they happen because you know they're coming in advance. You know the way in which they come and you know the approximate time in which they come. Why not plan for them and reduce their effectiveness? by knowing in advance and planning in advance. So three things we talked about today, the sources of financing, the dirty cap table, and the $3 million crisis. Three things to think about. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report and Burkonomics.